church you we have a great God and whatever you are going through I have good news for you it came to pass it's not going to stay there forever no cross is forever no storm is forever God is forever I thank you so much for this kind invitation this morning Mr. President thank you so much and Veronica and all the team we are going to take a look at God in the book of Exodus um some um, pictures of the Lord in this book, which is, as we will see during the week, full of Egyptology. And because it's taking place in this setting of Egypt, um, this, just for this particular um, um, element will give life to what we are going to say. There are many things going on in the book of Exodus. And today, one of the first things that, that we would like to talk about is God's adaptability in the book of Exodus. God's adaptability. And the first verse that we're going to take a look is um, Exodus chapter uh, 6, verse 2. The way he describes himself, important about him, important. Uh, the book of Exodus chapter 6, verse 2 it says, God also spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. So here he is saying, when I met Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I introduced myself as God Almighty. It says here in this version. But my name, uh, Yahweh or Adonai, I didn't reveal to them. That's what he's saying. Now, here we have the word um, God Almighty, it says here. I, I, uh, he's saying to, he's saying to, um, to, to Moses, um, I am Yahweh, I am Jehovah. Uh, when I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, this is in Genesis 17, 1, that it says that when Abraham was 99 years old, he appeared to Abraham and said, I am God Almighty. This is how we have it in the Bible here. Now, in Hebrew, it is El Shaddai. So he says in Genesis 17, 1, which is the reference that God is making here, he's, he's referring to 17, 1, Genesis. He's saying, when I talked to Abraham that time, I didn't tell him, I am Jehovah. I told him, I am El Shaddai. That's what he's saying here. And he's making a, a drastic distinction because something is about to happen. Now, El Shaddai here is, has been translated as God Almighty. But it's a little bit more than that. Actually, El Shaddai or Shaddad, means to breastfeed. <gasps> That's right. And I will just give you that one for today so you can come tomorrow again. <laughs> just that one. To breastfeed. So he's saying, when I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what I did was to take care of them as if they were little children. I breastfeed them. And now, why is that? Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were the beginning of the covenant. The, the church is in baby steps. It's learning to walk. And so what they need at that time is not Jehovah. What they needed at that time was El Shaddai. Somebody that will carry them with patience and that will guide them like a little baby. And that is why God Almighty, the omnipotent and omnipresent, adopted and adapted himself 
to the needs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he didn't run. He couldn't run because they could not run either. So he has to adapt himself to their needs. Not only to their needs, but also to the level of faith they had at that moment. So he decided, he said, in order for them to understand me, I will have to breastfeed them, take care of them, carry them, be patient with them, and wake up at whatever time they cry out in the night. You remember those days? So now he is willing to take off the clothing of God Almighty and put the a apron. Is it apron? Yes, the apron. And cook for them and click for them and prepare the bottle for them and have them here. This is, now, for some reason, of course, probably that stage of God seems too basic and we prefer to call him um, Almighty, which is not bad. But it doesn't say everything that this name encapsulates. He is being a mother to them. That's what he's being. Not only a mother, but he is a mother that just gave birth to them. Hello. You see the flexibility of God, the capability of God. And some years later, we have a different situation. Some years later, we are in front of Moses, and there is a trouble. There is there are trouble here now. We are in big trouble. And in, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, he says, I have heard and I have seen what they are doing to my people in Egypt. 3, 7. And interesting that he says... I have seen, I have observed, I have been aware, and I have been seen, and I have heard what the Egyptians are doing to my people. And then number three, he says, and I am coming down to set them free. So he is the God not, that not only sees and hears, he is the God of action too. Because you can see something and do nothing about it. I remember being in a place, I think it was in planet Jupiter, I don't remember well. There was somebody who was always complaining about the table being dirty. All the time, that table is always dirty. That table is always dirty. Until one day he came to my mind and said, Sister, maybe the Lord has given you the ministry of cleaning tables. <laughs> maybe you are the one called for this hour in order to make that table shine so much that even the atheists will say, praise the Lord. <laughs> Maybe you have been called for that. It's easy to see and talk. You don't need to do too much to talk. You just have to have a mouth. You have a mouth, you can talk. But we have, given, we have been given one mouth and two hands. It, it looks like from the beginning God intended us to do more than what we talk. And so God in Exodus chapter 3, verse 7 says, I have seen, I have heard, and I'm coming down to put an end to this. And he came down to set the captives free. So, my dear brothers and sisters, here you have him now in chapter 6 talking with, um, uh, with Moses and telling him the same thing again, saying, I have seen and I have heard what you have not seen and what you have not heard. Let me tell you that God has seen in your life what nobody else has seen. And he has heard what nobody has heard. That's why I like him so much. Because he sees what the church doesn't see. He sees what your neighbor doesn't see. He sees what society doesn't see. He sees the reality. He sees your reality. And he acts accordingly. And that is why we sometimes say, oh, why did he do that? He has been seeing for a long time. That is why it's not a surprise. He has been seeing and hearing. Another point interesting in this, uh, in this, in this um, verse is that he says, I see how they are mistreated. I have seen their misery and I have heard their misery. 
In, 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 the, in the introduction of this, um, uh, in the book of Exodus, we hear nothing good about them being in Egypt except mistreatment. However, look at this. The Lord is describing the mistreatment and the misery that they have. And he says, and I have decided to come down to put an end. Because even God gets tired of seeing his children oppressed. So that's why we need to keep on praying for this nation. Amen? Amen. The Bible says and when you are in that nation, in Jeremiah, pray for the nation. And if it goes well with the nation, it will go well with you too. We don't mind if you don't believe in God. We believe in God and we will pray for you anyway. There is a book entitled The Count of Monte Cristo. And uh, when, when the count is about to leave, um, the, the priest that is there that gave him the map for him to get out of jail and, uh, and find the treasure, um, he, the, the priest tells him, God bless you, go in peace. And the count, because he has been very mistreated, he turns around and he says, I don't believe in God anymore. And the priest looked at him and said, it doesn't matter, God believes in you anyway. <laughs> So sometimes you turn your back on him, he won't let you go. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. He will not let you go without a big, big fight. And he will make sure you understand that he loves you. Madly in love with you will not let you go without a fight. And so, my brothers and sisters, down here now, he comes and says, I have seen Moses and I have heard what is going on. And I have seen how he, they have been mistreated, how they are beaten, how they are emotionally abused, how they are psychologically abused, how they are physically abused, how they are humiliated and mistreated, how they are mocked and put down. I have seen all of that. You haven't, but I have seen it. And again, I say the Lord has seen your misery and is getting ready to come down and set you free. Do you want to be free? Now... The problem is that when they go through the desert and God is treating them well, he is treating them with courtesy, they say, we want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back because we remember the big pots of fish and onions and what is that again? Rice and beans and yam. And these big bananas that Pharaoh brought to us, we remember when we just were playing, uh, you know, little lighting hood around it. But when I look at Exodus, I don't, I don't see no fish and no big pots. I see it weeping and beating. But they were accustomed to be mistreated so bad that when they were treated correctly, they couldn't handle it. And some of us, are so mistreated to be fighting and kicking and beating and biting that when we are in a place where peace prevails, we feel uncomfortable. And that is why you see so many churches, but not here, in planet Jupiter. That there are people that they cannot tolerate seeing peace and harmony. They are accustomed to the weep of Pharaoh. Maybe from childhood, Maybe later on, wherever the source is, there are many places on this earth where there are people who say, too much love in here. We need some crisis. We need some gossip. We need some blood running. This too, too much love in this church board. Too much harmony. Too much respect. No, 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 no. We need some heads rolling. And it doesn't matter how you treat them, there is no way to make them feel loved. They are accustomed to the weep of Pharaoh. And so, if you put a cloud on top of them to cover them from the sun, there was, I remember Pharaoh. Pharaoh was there. He gave us fish, and he gave us onions, that which, which is a weird combination, but okay. It's like a girlfriend, but just for, for the sake of comparison, that was uh, uh, going out uh, with Jimmy, and Jimmy mistreated her and put her down and made jokes about her in front of the friends and mocked her and laughed at her expense. And one day, she got tired for some reason, and now he's, he, she's uh, dating Raymond. And Raymond 
gizzard chocolates and, 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 and teddy bears and, 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 and she, and, 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 and you, you know what I'm saying. And, and, and a flower and, and, and baby come over here. And, and, and he doesn't sit until she sits down. She is uncomfortable. She doesn't, when are you going to slap me? What do you mean when I'm going to slap you? Well, it has been already 24 hours since we have been dating and you haven't kicked me or insulted me. What are you going to do? She misses that thing. Becomes a pathology. And they have that issue. And it's time for us to put an end to that. Amen? Yeah. It's, it's, it's time to allow the Lord to disintoxicate us. And to look in the mirror and say, you have a problem. You got mail, right? You have a problem. And we need to fix it. So they had this problem. They, they, they just can't get accustomed to being loved, to being hugged and well-treated. And some of us have gone through so much, we have forgotten that too. We have forgotten how to treat others well or how to be treated well. Our sense of worth is gone. And we have forgotten who we are. Where the Lord this morning wants to tell you that he loves you and that you are valuable to him. You know how much you're worth? You are worth the blood of God. That's a lot. So remember that. So they are now walking uh, and being mistreated, being well-treated and rejecting that, accustomed to being mistreated. And so Moses, God says to Moses, I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai. But right now, under the present circumstances, you don't need a Shaddai. You need Yahweh. And Yahweh, Yahweh is a warrior. Yahweh, Yahweh is a restorer and a deliverer. Yahweh fights. Yahweh rolls his lips and says, time to get some action here. I'm tired of saying this. The situation that the Israelites were experimenting at that time required Yahweh. And so you see God then now taking the April and putting the bottle down and putting a helmet and a sword in the hand, ready to fight. Oh, that's a lot of flexibility, isn't it? Our God is humble, capable of adapting himself to your particular need. So you see now that he changes the role and assumes the role of a fighting God and challenges Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I don't know who is Jehovah and I'm not going to let the people go. And almost all the plague says, I am Jehovah and I will do this so you know who I am. It's a direct answer. So they are in a fight. Even God gets tired. And so, my friends, he comes down and fights, as we will see later on. But today, what I would like to leave with you is the fact that this exchange of names and roles say that God is practical. Very, very down to earth. That God works with what works. That if he sees the need is A, he will say, we need to implement A. And that is good news for your situation. That is good news for the situation that this nation is confronting right now. Because probably who we need right now is Yahweh. He will put the helmet on and take the sword and set the captives free. But not only that. This also says that God is flexible. And that implies that he is not dogmatic. That he is not close-minded. That he is not fundamentalist. That he will not enforce, even God himself, will not enforce his views when they see that the time is not appropriate. We all need to learn that, don't we? Now that also says that God is sure of whom he is. And that because he's sure of whom he is, 
He can be one day El Shaddai and the other one that he can be Yahweh. No problem. Why? Because he knows that the essence of who he is will not change. When we know that, we will be able to do whatever job we are assigned in church and be happy about it. Just like God does. I remember when I was in Newville, one of my jobs was to be, uh, well, I, of course, I don't want to boast about it, but I was the president of Ecological Equilibrium, a high position, of course. Uh, w that means that I used to clean the, the, the bathrooms. That's what it means. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think about it, it's true, you know. So there I was with my team, my whole crew, me and the guy that I used to look at in the mirror every morning. My bucket and my mop. And so we went there. And one day I was in a corner scrubbing the floor on my knees. And a good friend of mine asked me this question. And the question was asked um, in all sincerity. The person was actually concerned and, and felt a little bit upset about seeing me there. And he said, um, the person said, um, aren't you, uh, don't you feel bad about being down there um, scrubbing this floor in a corner alone? Because I understand you, you were a pastor in the U.S., and you have a church of 650 members. And we have a TV program, a radio program, and a program for the cat, and everything. We have a church with 750 youth in a week of prayer. And it was so much so that sometimes uh, the church was so packed in the week of prayer that we have to broadcast this, the, 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 the week of prayer by radio. And so the church, the rest of the church will stay in the parking lot uh, listening to the, to the... And so the person was referring to that and said, now suddenly you are alone in a corner scrubbing uh, floors. Don't, don't you feel like you are missing something? And I will tell you this, my dear brothers and sisters. The answer at that moment was no. No, I don't feel bad. Because when I was in America, I was a child of God that happens to be a pastor. Now that I'm here in this corner, I am a child of God that happens to be scrubbing floors. But my value has not changed. Just, just what I was doing. You know whom I learned that from? When you go home, you will read it in um, John chapter 13. They were there. People were looking at themselves. Nobody wanted to wash the feet of the disciples. I'm not going to lower myself to do that. You are going to, who are we going to? You know the picture that Da Vinci made that everybody's like, like that? I think that was in the moment where said, are you going to wash the feet? Not me. <laughs> I think that that was the moment. Because <laughs> nobody wanted to do it. And then suddenly, you will go home, read it, and underline it. It says, and Jesus. <laughs> Usually we just say, and the Lord woke up from the table, uh, from the, uh, got up from the chair and washed the feet of the, mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no. It wasn't like that. It says, and Jesus knowing that he came from the Father and that the Father gave him everything and that he was going to go back to the Father, he got up and washed the feet of the disciples. Why? He knew where he came from and he knew where he was going. And not only that, he knew what he had. And when you know who you are in Jesus, you may be the first elder on one year and on the next year, you can be the smallest of the deacons, and still you will be happy. Because you know who you are. There is a value here that no one can take away. And Jesus, knowing that, he said, I know my value. I know who I am. I can do this. And he did it. When you see somebody fighting over position, when you see people fighting and making bands and political movements, in Jupiter or Neptune, you are dealing with people that do not know who they are, whose value has been limited to holding a microphone every Sabbath or wearing a necktie. But when you know who you are, whether it is a necktie or you are scrubbing floors, you will do it happy because you are doing it for the Lord. The Lord put you there. So we made sure those bathrooms were so clear that even the worst of the atheists would say, Place the Lord. <laughs> Yes, that's right. And that's what you see in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. God is so sure of himself 
that he says, I can do this too. So he is flexible. He is not dogmatic. He knows who he is and his value. And that is why he's humble and he can do the job. And so this is where he wants to take us, my brothers and sisters, to break that, that idol. He can adapt to your situation. He is mature. He is adaptable. He is willing to say, I can do this and I can help. And he recognizes the existential needs of his children. That is what you are going through right now and right here. And I have seen it and I have heard it and I am coming down to help you. Because God is so adaptable, he was capable of being a cloud in the day to cover the sun and a column of fire in the evening. Do you see that? This is being adaptable and being flexible. He is a practical, loving, and humble God. Anxious for you to come and talk to him. And it's not the first time that he, that he decides to come down and set the captives free. When you go to John 1, you will see that he was all the way up there with God in the beginning. But he saw the need, and he saw how Pharaoh was whipping his children. And the Bible says, and the word became flesh and came down. God wants to come down to your situation. There was um, a man, uh, I think the, the bear... I hope I'm not wrong, it's Jack, seven foot, two inches tall. And he raised that bear since it was a little baby. And it grew up to be a movie star, that bear. Do you know how he fed him when he found him alone? Um, he used to go on his knees, the man, and he would take the food and chew the food. Chew the food, right? To masticate it. Is that the word? Yes. And then he will open his mouth, and the little tiny bear will come and eat from his mouth. That was the only way that he could eat. Yeah, he was a baby. He, couldn't, he didn't know. But the man, this big man, had to go down on his knees and pretend that he was a bear. In order for the bear to come and eat from him, he will take the food, he will chew the food, he will then make it uh, eatable for the little baby bear, and then open the mouth. The bear would come running and eat from his own mouth. That bear grew up to be a giant seven two, seven feet, two inches. And when they were making movies, um, he would be there, because there are some movies where the bear is fighting, and sometimes it's a real bear. And so when the take would come, the owner of the bear will step in. I said, okay, I will do this one. So, of course, they would put the makeup and make it look like the movie star. And so he would say, okay, now uh, punch me, but not too hard. <laughs> and the bear would go, mmm, and punch. No, 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 a little bit stronger. Mmm. And that's how it was. So in the movie, we see the bear fighting, and we think it's Brad Pitt or somebody else. But it's not. It's the owner of the bear. And that bear loved that man. For that bear, that man was his mother. Because he had the ability, the flexibility to become a bear. To come down to his knees, to chew the food, to breastfeed him. And that bear was crazy about this man. And obey him, and listen to him, and loved him, and respect him. You see, brothers and sisters, that what made that bear love that man wasn't whipping and beating him and insulting him. Love is very strong. Very, very strong. And Moses, later on, learned that lesson. One day, he was standing in the rock, and he said, do you want water? And he hit the rock. And he took the stick and just hit it. And it, it, it didn't work. Beating people don't work. No, it doesn't. Bible says, the Bible says, do you understand that his love and mercy will lead you to repentance? That even when you are in front of a temptation, you say, but he loves me so much, how am I going to do this? He is flexible, and he comes down to his knees and adapts to his situation. So, only you and him know what you are going through this morning. What I came to tell you this morning that he has seen 
what nobody else has seen, he has heard, what no one else has heard, or probably what no one else will ever hear. Here. He has seen it, and he is coming down to set you free. Do you want to be free? Do you really want to be free in the name of Jesus? Well, today we have a God that is anxious for you to talk to him. It's a God that is anxious to walk with you, to save you, and to redeem you. Because he wants you to have life, and life more abundantly. So it's my prayer that today the Lord reaches, heal us, and restore us. He's on his way. Today we have seen the first part of this journey that we will take. It's my prayer that the Lord may bless you. And uh, do not give up. He is on his way. He has seen your tears. He is aware. He knows. He has seen and he has heard. And he is getting ready to cut the chains and to set you free. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your mercy and your love. Thank you for your humbleness. Thank you for being a, an adaptable, practical God. You know what your sons and daughters are going through this morning. And we ask you to bless them and to protect them. Father, thank you for knowing our situation. Thank you for remembering that we are dust. Thank you for being a God that is uh, capable of adapting, uh, of being practical, of uh, responding to our particular needs. Thank you for being almighty. Thank you for being all powerful. And thank you for being our friend. Thank you for being willing to come down to where we are to meet us, Father. Because you know we don't have the strength to get to you, you have decided to come down and meet us halfway. We thank you for hearing us and bless this congregation, Lord. Um, restore our souls and minds. Break the chains and set the captives free. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for your patience. Amen. Amen.